Hare Krishna, Guru Prabhu. Welcome back to the Monk Podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Always wonderful to be here in dialogue with you, Chaitanya Charanji. Yes, bro. It's always pleasurable. I thought today maybe we could make it more special because one of the books which we share a love for is the Gita and Gita Jayanti is coming up now. So I thought we could discuss about the Gita from a, from a, not, we, we have discussed it from a, we could say more focused perspective of what the, the Gita secret message is and how that secret is developed in the Gita. But from a broader perspective, if say a new person who wants to know what the Gita is all about and how the Gita stands out among the various wisdom texts of the world, various sacred texts of the world. So I thought we could discuss on that topic today. That's wonderful. Okay. Well, I think, you know, the Bhagavad Gita has been powerfully impactful in the West, what to speak of all over India. But what fascinates me is how Westerners have really taken to the Gita, where there are hundreds of translations of the Bhagavad Gita since 1785 with the Charles Wilkins translation in England. And this since then, the the tra- yeah. see, from an yeah. insider perspective, that there are hundreds of translations, you may say, oh, they don't give the real meaning of the Gita. And we might, we might uh, be critical about that. But just to look from other perspective, the fact that so many people felt the Gita so important that they commented yes. on it, that itself is significant. Yes. yes. And they, they keep translating it because they keep trying to get at the meaning. Hmm. I think it's a testimonial that they never quite get to the meaning. And then Srila Prabhupada came along with his translation and suddenly sprouting everywhere around the world are bhaktas or persons devoted to practicing the life of the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. To live the Gita, to live the Gita's message. So, that's that's an important distinction right there, how the effects of different translations um, really can be seen. But let's go back to the starting point, the major sacred texts of the world. The Bhagavad Gita is seen among the two other ones, the Bible and the Quran. You know, the Bible has 31,102 verses. That's a large book, 31,102 verses. And the Hebrew Bible itself has 23,145 verses. Whereas the New Testament has 7,956, close to 8,000 verses. Still a lot of verses. The Quran comes along, and it has 6,236 verses. So it's still smaller than the New Testament. The New Testament's smaller than the Hebrew Bible. And then the Bhagavad Gita comes along, and it has only 700 verses. I mean, it's a a tiny little text compared to the Quran. The Quran is smaller than the New Testament. The New Testament is smaller than the Bible. So it's very interesting to compare the the sheer, uh, you know, volume differences among the three. But but look, here's the thing. Each of these scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Quran, they sound like scriptures to the Western ear. They sound like scriptures. Listen to the, the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, this is the this kind of cosmogony, you know, this kind of creation of all the universe, the whole universe. Wow. Sounds like a scripture, Chaitanya Charanji, wouldn't you say? I mean, it's, yes. it's, it's very, very dramatic, right? Okay. 
So, but then let's move to the New Testament. The Gospel of Mark, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in, out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So immediately in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament, this, this is from the Gospel of Mark, the first gospel writer, what you've got is a kind of front-loading of the divinity. You know, God is right up front. I mean, he, the announcement of God, his power, um, uh, the name of Jesus Christ, and the validity uh, confirmed in an older uh, book of the Hebrew Bible, the book of Isaiah, um, anticipating the arrival of the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. I mean, this is very much a proclamational type of writing. Okay. And then you get that also, you know, with the Gospel of John, the more Gnostic, mystical writing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. So very mystical, right? Very mystical writing. Sounds like a scripture. What about the Quran? Glory to Allah, most high, full of grace and mercy. He created all, including man. To man, he gave a special place in his creation. He honored man to be his agent, and to that end, endued him with understanding, and, and, and so on. And you know, So Allah is right there, front-loaded, right? Jesus Christ is front-loaded. God, as the creator, is front-loaded. What does the uh, Bhagavad Gita, how does the Bhagavad Gita begin? On the field of Dharma, yeah. on the field of Guru, assembled together, desiring to fight, were my armies and indeed those of the sons of Pandu. How did they act, O Sanjaya? What? Does this sound like a scripture? Wait a minute. On the field of Dharma, on the field of crew, assembled together, desiring to fight? Wait a minute. I'm entering a battlefield? How does this sound like a scripture? To the Western ear, it doesn't sound like a scripture. But how does it compare to the others? This is what I would say, Chaitanya Charanji. The Gita does not front load divinity. It does not immediately establish who divinity is, what the name of divinity is, how powerful the divinity is. No, it starts with the human condition. Beautiful. This is so the genius of divinity. the Gita. It's a very nice yeah. front load divinity. <laughs> yeah. It, but this is the genius of the Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Charanji. I would pro proffer that the genius of the Bhagavad Gita is not to st start with something maybe more individual, particular uh, relationship to a particular culture or religious tradition, but rather to begin with what every human being is confronted with, the human condition. Mm. That's where the Gita begins. And that sets it apart from the Quran, the New Testament, and the Hebrew Bible. Mm, so true. So, oh, in one sense, we can go further and say that there is a white, quite a vivid revelation of divinity. It's like the divinity, divinity is functioning at a human level and directly speaking. And then there is also the theophany of the universal form. So there is a lot about divinity yes. in the Gita, but it doesn't start off with that. Oh, yes. It doesn't burn the reader with that. The reader begins with the human condition. We are all on our individual battlefields. Hmm. We're all struggling with the conflict between our inner dharmic nature and our outer conditioned nature. Our inner true nature and our outer limited temporal conditioned nature. The harmony between the two is 
a, an, a, a, an amazing human achievement. And this is where the Gita goes. And it wastes no time in letting the reader know that if one knows how to read the Gita. Okay. That's beautiful. So let's get into this direction that uh, we took up one, one contrast between the Gita and uh, the Gita stands out. Are there any other ways also? So maybe in any contrast, basically you talk about two things, isn't it? Like we look at similarities, we look at differences also. So yes, uh, are there, one is of course the length, as you mentioned, the other is the, the beginning. The third could be broadly the, it's not just a revelation of divinity. It's a, not, not, not just like a, the revelation is not just in terms of the words, the revelation is also in the personal, in the sense of a personal presence and the personal vision. Yeah. So yeah, you could like to go ahead in that direction first, and then we can look at some of the. Universe. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I mean, the very fact that the Gita is essentially in its 18 chapters, it's 700 verses. The very fact that divinity is able to speak intimately to humanity is extraordinary. Mm. It's extraordinary. Virtually the whole Gita is a recorded conversation between humanity and divinity. Mm. You know, the, it's funny, there are, there are some self-help books that have come out in the past uh, conversations with God, and people imagine what would God say if we brought certain things uh, to such a divinity? What what would be the, the divine responses and so on? Well, this has already occurred. This occurred thousands of years ago when Krishna spoke to Arjuna. This shows the potential intimacy that humanity can have with divinity, this loving connection that can occur between the two. And the whole is about that. Wait a minute. You talk about two distinct things over here. One is yeah. that uh, you talk about like self-help books come up, and then you talk about the intimate connection between humanity and divinity. Are these two different topics we are going to discuss, or are the two topics related, you are saying? Okay, just that there, the more the latter, that that in the self-help industry, there have been attempts to try to understand what it would be like to have a conversation with God. My point oh, okay, okay. here is, that is my point here is that there's already been a conversation with God. We don't have to imagine what the conversation of God would be like. Hmm. Yeah, there's a... You see? Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, the, right here, Chaitanya Charanji, you and I know that there is a beautiful, beautiful, you know, interaction, ex, interchange uh, uh, between Krishna and Arjuna. But it begin, it's precipitated. That conversation is precipitated by not God giving His laws and His. Um, uh, directions and his um, demands on humanity, but rather it's the human need become ourselves. It's the human need to call out to divinity for guidance. And that's exactly what Arjuna does. He stands in for the rest of us. He finds himself in an incredibly painful situation that he cannot resolve on the basis of outer worldly, uh, uh, you know, situations. He cannot solve it on a, on an external level. And this is why Krishna orders Arjuna, uh, or does order, but, you know, encourages and, and, and directs Arjuna to go within to solve the problems that he, that confronted him. This is what makes the Gita a universal book. It starts with the human condition. It doesn't start with the divine proclamation. 
as you know, divinity is not really defined or announced until the beginning of the fourth chapter. Four chapters in. It's not front-loading divinity. It's gently revealing divinity in relation to the human condition, not that divinity is in some sense uh, uh, commanding submission and surrender. No, no. Mm -mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost divinity. like in the fourth chapter, Krishna's self yeah. is almost incidental to addressing Arjuna's question. So exactly, is, beautifully put. Yeah, exactly. So the question about the dilemma, you know, I am faced with the ethical, emotional, existential conflict over here. What am I? What is the right thing to do? And in answering right. that question, Krishna develops a answer very systematically and then yes moves forward so moves forward till it brings you could divinity is you could say brought up front from the seventh chapter itself so right there was one devotee with whom I was talking that in one sense the Gita contains wisdom which even a atheist can appreciate. So now yes. I, I was a little taken aback by that thought initially because I was thinking at one level, unless you accept the basic premises of spirituality, even if somebody doesn't accept God, at least they have to accept the idea of Atma, the idea of there is something imperishable within us. Without that, right. how does Gita speak? But then we were discussing a little bit further. So what he, he was making the point that the Gita, in one sense, the Gita is folk, the, see, there is, the focus is how to live. And the philosophy is like a build up to reinforce the guideline about how to live. Yes. So, in one sense, the Bhagavad Gita also addresses many different philosophies. It has its own philosophy, but the guidelines about how to live. So, for example, the framework of the three modes is something which any thoughtful person can appreciate, even if they actually don't uh, don't you could say to use a contemporary language buy into the the business of the soul and god so that's yes something you can appreciate so there is much like that it was yes. like a, a paradigm altering concept that so like Prabhupada at one level gives us a presentation of the gita based on centered on krishna and yes that is like yes. an inclusive presentation but at the same time for those who are not ready for that it is not one zero the Gita doesn't reject it. If you don't accept Krishna, then there is nothing in the Gita for you. Gita's approach is not like that. Right. Mm. Beautifully put. Uh, that is exactly right, uh, Chaitanya Charanji. Um, the Gita, the, yes, it's, it's completely understandable how a non-theist or an atheist could take to the Gita and say, this is really valuable literature. You know, it could be very meaningful to such a person. Why? Because it starts with the human condition. It doesn't, in some sense, urge or even force a reader to accept the identification of divinity. This is not required in the Gita. Hmm. Prabhu, Prabhupada even asks his reader in the introduction, just accept that this is a dialogue that actually happened and see what kind of effect it has on you. You know, at least accept it theoretically. See what it does. Mm. Because these 700 verses that, that can be read within three hours easily mm. are powerful. They are powerful verses that elicit. Um, universal messages, important universal messages. And uh, perhaps I could even go through at least eight universal messages that I find in the Gita that I feel anyone could ultimately pick up from the Gita if they read into it more deeply. Beautiful. Eight universal lessons, principles. Yeah, let's, let's yeah. dive into that then. You, like you want to dive into that? Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's let's get ready. 
Okay. The first universal principle is much of what we have already just spoken. Quickly just reviewed as the first teaching, which is there is conflict when the inner nature, the true inner nature, and the conditioned outer nature of the self come together. The essential teaching of the Bhagavad Gita is to bring these two natures together in a harmonious union. That's called yoga. Mm. To bring our inner nature and our outer, outer natures together, that's called yoga. See, now this begins with the human condition. You see that? Later we'll learn that yoga means even much more than that. But this is the first um, uh, universal message that I find in the Gita. The second one is that the Gita immediately challenges every reader by its first words, spoken by Dhritarashtra. How do we live in a world filled with conflict, pain, and suffering? The Gita recognizes that this world is a very mixed place. There's so much that's beautiful, but so much, frankly, that even moves into the horrible. So the Gita addresses this, you know, this mixed world, okay? And how do we navigate through a world that really is filled with conflict, pain, and suffering? The third principle is in this outer world, there will always be irresolvable ethical conflicts. You know, if we are born into this world, we had better be ready to understand that there will never be perfect ethical solutions to world problems. Look how the world is so divisive today. You know, just a minute. conservative, are you, are you liberal. Are you sort of developing these one by one as principles? Or is this like a summary of the first principle? Oh, no, these are just, I'm just sort of listing eight okay. things that I think the Gita really delivers. You know, yes. that, that one reading the Gita could, could expect to meet with these eight principles, okay. these you know, eight universal ideas. Each of these is very important idea. I'm not sure whether we can maybe just take five, 10 minutes on each of these and at itself will encompass the whole podcast. So yes. can, let's start from the beginning. You would like to do a summary first and then we can come back to each of them. Or how do you want to do it? Um, well, I'm sort of going through them and then we can come back to them. Sure, I thought. Please, please go ahead. You know? Okay. Okay. So the third one, um, as I've already mentioned, right, is this outer world, in this outer world, there will always be irresolvable ethical conflicts because this world is fraught with dualism. Uh, a duality, I meant to say, duality. It's, it's, there's this, there's that, there are opposing forces, uh, conservative, liberal, you know, in our country, in America, uh, Democrat, Republican, you know, there's, there are always, you know, forces, opposing forces everywhere. Mm. We will never be able to solve them in this world. The only way they can be solved at all is inside. Okay, we can, we can come back. But here's the fourth one. The Gita talks about being sensitive to the thoughts and feelings of other humans and of other living beings. And in general, to be sensitive to all life, and thus to hold all life as precious. All life as precious. Mm. This is not this just human species, but all life. You know, it goes, goes beyond. All species. life. Yes. Mm. What to speak of humans. What to speak of humans. Yes, exactly. So the Gita really uh, calls our attention to the life itself, the life energy um, that goes beyond the temporal world, but that moves through the temporal world. Okay, so let's go to the fifth. That's nicely put. The fifth is ultimate reality embraces us everywhere from the space within Pusha, from the space without as the Vishwarupa, and further as Brahman. Mm. 
Yet from within the deepest space of the heart, the divine calls us to come to him or lovingly submit ourselves to him. So this is this idea that Bhagavan, the word Bhagavan, as in Bhagavad Gita, right? Bhagavad, one who embraces all reality. Bhagavad Gita, all aspects of reality. One embraces all aspects of reality. This is the divine. This is the image that the Gita has of divinity. The one who embraces everything. Okay? So, again, I feel this is a very universal message, even when it comes to divinity. Number six, the divine is calling us, and it is a matter of whether we can hear the divine. Krishna speaks about souls offering themselves to him or even coming to him throughout the conversation at least 22 times. Krishna, throughout the Gita, is, is preoccupied with the idea that souls can come to him, they can return to his nature, can enter his form of being to interact intimately with him. And the Gita itself is demonstrative of that in the conversation between Krishna himself with, uh, in, uh, with Arjuna. So there is this longing from and yearning from the divine for us to come, for humans to come to uh, divinity, to come closer to divinity. Then the seventh, the most intimate connection with the divine is available to humans, but it is the greatest secret of all secrets, and it is the Gita's supreme teaching of yoga. Okay, so this gets into uh, this incredible lofty achievements that humans are capable of if they apply themselves to the practice of bhakti. The idea that there are many relationships to be had with all reality and with the source of, of all reality, the divine. And so the Gita really tries to invite, it's an invitation into the most intimate aspects of Godhead. Mm. It's an invitation. It's a calling. And then lastly, once this deepest inner connection is made, we then become capable of acting out of love, thus cultivating a genuine sensitivity toward all beings and toward the earth. Once we have that intimate connection with the divine, we then can become as souls ambassadors of divine love and heal a world in great need. Okay, so the difference between this and the earlier point is that, first of all, the Gita itself is sensitive. And now the Gita is telling us how we can become sensitive. So it's more yes. like a intellectual and then transformational. Yes. Okay. Well put. That's very nice. So you see, here's the point, Chaitanya Charanji, that the Gita, so much can be gained from reading the Gita in strengthening the true self, in growing the true self, in the blossoming of the true self, in relation to the whole of reality, and to the most intimate dimensions of divinity. And this is really such a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, you know, vision that the Gita has. Um, but it takes many, many, many readings, and ideally it's a reading with a teacher and um, a reading from a teacher. Uh, with a bhashya and illuminations that really uh, 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 go deep into the reader. Hmm. Makes sense. So reading yeah. with a teacher and reading from a teacher, you said, is it? That's, that's yes. Differentiating it, yeah. 
Yes, indeed. So the Gita speaks in these universal ways, and I'm sure there are other universal messages in the Gita. But again, it speaks, it begins with the human condition and the human potential and, and how we can reach that human potential to be totally fulfilled in this life and connected to something that is eternal and beyond. Hmm. Truly a profound text. It's amazing. And so, this is, so do you want to go into the principles one by one then? This is. That's the, that we can do. That's right. The first one, Chaitanya Charan, just, just before is what we already point, talked about. So, just to make one point. Yeah. That sure. in one sense, it's an art because our tradition is quite specific. There's a specific conception of, a specific, not just a conception, but a visualization of divinity. It's very, very specific. And sometimes the specific, many people just equate the specific reflexively with sectarian. So yeah, now that is itself, I think, a philosophical subject, whether the spe something specific makes something sectarian or not. But that's why it's almost a, it's almost an art in itself to how to preserve the specifics of our specificity of our tradition while also presenting its universality. I think what you're doing right. is, is uh, you know, the eight principles you're talking about, and we're trying to do that over here. In one sense, right. present the uniqueness or the specificity in universal. Right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, sometimes people get nervous with specificity. You know, the, the, the way the Gita can speak about, you know, Krishna's different manifestations and his different ways in which um, divinity um, can embrace uh, humanity. And yet there is something kind of paradoxical there. Within that specificity of the Gita, of the Gita's articulations, there is something universal at the same time. And I think that's what, that is, I think that's undeniable. And I think that people in the West um, find the Gita just so endearing. One who sees me everywhere and sees all things in me, to such a person I am never lost nor such a person ever lost to me. How, how can one read that and not feel the love of divinity? Mm. It rings so true to the heart. And that is why I think people can read the Gita in the West and not get bogged down by mere specificity, but rather within this particular uh, special articulations, particular, the particular uh, specifications of divinity, there is universal relatedness in it. Hmm. That's very beautifully put. So overall, yeah, let's uh, let's see if we can uh, see even your book, which you talked about as the beloved Lord's secret love song. So what we were doing is that Bhagwan itself can sound like a sectarian term, but the beloved Lord yes. is quite universal. And then Gita, and you're talking about the bhakti message of the Gita. Now, in one sense, if I'm not mistaken the word bhakti is often seen in a universal sense, at least in the Western world. Yoga is, of course, seen as universal, but bhakti also yes. is seen as universal. But still, if we, we talk about a secret love song, the idea of love being presented in that way and the song of the Gita, that makes it, that's itself as a good ex ex example of how the specific can be presented in universal terms. Mm. Yeah. So let's maybe go, go ahead yes. and one by one then. Yes. 
Um, yes, you know, it is, it is love coming from the divine. When focusing on the love coming from the divine, this suddenly allows one to break out of specificity into universality. It is love that it, it is. But when you talk about cosmogenesis, you talk about doctrine, you talk about this and, 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 um, uh, and, and different practices and so on, those things will vary. Those things will vary from culture to culture, religion to religion. Those are, are transcended is when one talks about divine love. Oh, okay. So I just lost you for a minute. Is this those cultures are transcended when we talk about divine love? Was that your point? I lost you for about 20 seconds. Yes. 20 seconds. Yes. Love, love, love breaks down the boundaries of specific traditions with their specific practices. Love is what breaks down the boundaries of, 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 of okay. religious differences. It breaks down the boundaries of the temporal with the eternal. It, it breaks down the differences between uh, divinity and humanity. It, love is what joins all of this. Oh, okay. And that's why the individual teachings within the Gita are laced and woven with Krishna's loving words to Arjuna. Okay. And that's why he says at the end, don't worry about any of these dharmas. Because ultimately, that's not what's important. Feel my love for you. I am calling you. Please, feel my embrace. And perhaps one day, you will return that embrace. I've been waiting an eternity for you to return that embrace. I've been embracing you for an eternity. Now, maybe, now that we're connected in the Gita, maybe you will consider returning the embrace. Mm. Beautifully put. We'll consider returning and the embrace. yoga... Yeah, yoga. See, Bhagavan, there's, there's Bhagavad Yoga. The yoga of Bhagavan is the way he manifests in different ways. There's Vishwarupa, uh, uh, you know, uh, Brahman, Paramatman, or the Antaryaman, and Bhagavan. The, 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 that's Bhagavan Yoga. That's the, the Bhagavad Yoga. But the, 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 the human yoga, is ultimately to return the embrace of the divine who has been embracing us for an eternity. So yoga is the return embrace. Mm. That's the ultimate yoga, is the return embrace of divinity. It's beautiful. So we have discussed about yoga in these terms, the embrace in one sense, we appreciate the embrace at a deeper and deeper level as we move forward also. So that's right. That's wonderful. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, so let's maybe start with the first principle and move forward from there. So the first principle is basically to bring together in harmony one's inner true nature with one's outer conditioned nature. So at this level, there's a yoga. There's a yoga in the sense, instead of bringing these, instead of having these two levels of the human in conflict, which is represented by the Kurus coming together with the Pandavas on a battlefield, it, th there is the sense in which one can, you know, harmonize these two aspects of the human. So this is the very first teaching of the Gita is to become aware of the conflict, the inherent conflict between one's true nature and one's outer external nature. It's, it, the Gita wastes no time in doing that. The very first verse, right? 
Dharma Kshetre, Kuru Kshetre, Samaveta, Yoyotsavaha. They come together, Samaveta, in conflict, Yoyotsavaha. <laughs> that's, that's the whole problem right there, right? Our Dharma Kshetre, our true nature, nature, and Akuru Kshetre, our conditioned nature, Samaveta, Yoyotsavaha, they come together in conflict. So how should we act? then in a world of conflict, pain, and suffering. Immediately, the human condition is front-loaded. This is what everyone can understand and appreciate. Yes, it doesn't sound like the other scriptures, but it is, in fact, the situation of the human being. Hmm. So that's the, first, that's the first principle. The Gita delivers right away. Right away. Hmm. So at one level, if somebody reads the Gita without this universalist frame, it can seem too specific. Oh, there is some battle that happened thousands of years ago and there is this battle and there are these uh, these warriors. For some people, the warriors, can the names can also seem unpronounceable. So <laughs> that's right. But if, if one doesn't get too caught in the specifics, we could say the few incidents or few settings um, depict the vulnerability, the intensity, the, the uncertainty of the human condition as being on a battlefield. Yes. So in that sense, we could say the human condition is depicted in its in its acutest. Yes. Mm. Yes. And, you know, you know, Chichen and Charanji, it's, there's no wonder that the Gita would choose one of the most treacherous experiences a human can have going into war. This is awful. This is a, a dreadful, dreadful situation for a human. But the Gita is saying in, in a subtle way and symbolic way that we're all in, a, in, a, in the dreadful condition of, of a temporal existence, of birth and death. Uh, you know, the, life is simply hard. Life in this world is hard. We suffer from diseases. We suffer, um, uh, you know, uh, from 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 the way others treat us. Um, uh, we we suffer from from calamities of all kinds. But what? But where's the true us? That's the idea. The Gita challenges the reader. Where is the true you? Where is that field of Dharma? Dharma Kshetra. Where's that sphere of purity? Mm. Where is that? This is what the Gita challenges its reader. So when you say, where is that sphere of purity? I love that translation of Dharma Khetra also. So what we are saying is that uh, in the Gita, at one level, the name of the, the place is itself called Dharma Kshetra. But then Arjuna's question is about Dharma. What is Dharma? What is the right thing to do? So it's only when, That's we, right. when we do the right thing, then we could say we are in the sphere of purity. So it's not just That's a right. geographical location, but it's also, it's also, you could say, more of a psychological disposition or a spiritual orientation. So That's that is right. what the Gita is providing. That's when... Uh, when it will actually manifest as a dharma kshetra. So right. it's like we may be wherever we are, but what is the what is the we could say the right way of belonging to this place? What is the right way of contributing in this place? That's what will make it a dharma That's right. kshetra. Mm. That's right. That's right. Beautiful. The dharma kshetra. Mm. Yes. So in one sense, if we focus on Kurukshetra, it might seem a little yeah. specific and sectarian. But if you focus on dharma that's right. and understand the principle, then we say it's universal. That's right. Yeah. That's right. There you go. Mm. Yeah, wonderful, Ru. <laughs> it's very rich stuff. Very, very rich. 
hugely sir it's a search yes. for so in one sense later when the gita talks about how you can make your work a form of worship that is itself the same thing that you are transforming yeah. uh, your you say workplace into a, a sphere of purity a sphere of virtue a sphere of that's right the divinity itself manifests that's right it's it's that it's a kshetra parinama the transformation of one sphere of interactions and awareness and um and and, and again this is so powerful a message in the gita you change yourself you know you purify yourself you nourish your heart and you can affect so much change in the world in so many positive ways very powerfully mm. arjuna begins with a shattered heart shattered heart that's the phrase that's actually used shattered heart and then he is moved into a place where he finds himself and divinity within his heart and understands he can act from that place rather than from a reactive place hmm. the psychology of the gita is very complex chaitanya charanji it's very complex here by psychology you mean the thought process of krishna and arjuna or the what the gita tells us about our inner world in general because it could mean both things yes both <laughs> both <laughs> it's it's well one can get into such deep nuancing of one's understanding of the gita's profound messages but the ultimate message is krishna is yearning for the love of humans mm. but we are not ready to reciprocate that yearning yeah okay so i think that is one of the culminating points that will come let's go toward that from here now so one is okay the it speaks to the uni, 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 i think the first point was by matter it speaks to the human condition universal human condition that is a broad first yes. point that's right okay that's right mm-hmm. so what what follows the first idea is the second one which is how the gita confronts us with how do we act in a world filled with conflict pain and suffering okay the gita challenges the reader look around you look how much suffering there is mm. the gita challenges us look how much suffering your body is going to have to go through in this life what about all the calamities in the world what about all the 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 conflicts between peoples what about the natural disasters you know these are the things that confront us the gita wants to bring this into the foreground very sharply and understand have us understand what is our response to human suffering mm-hmm. see when you use the word conflict pain and suffering are you broadly correlating with them the three kinds of suffering say adhi bhautik adhi atmik adhi daivik or they just three words because in one sense conflict um, i would say i would say there's conflict pain and suffering in all three okay i would say yeah okay because adi bhautik is primarily conflict but in conflict leads to pain and suffering so pain, yeah, yeah, they're, 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 yeah 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 pain we could call yeah. it a little bit more of uh, related with our own body and mind primarily our body and suffering we could say it's like the broad human condition because of nature because of forces beyond us right mm. I well i mean you could yeah you you could you could sort of look at it that way i hadn't thought of that um but i what the way i was thinking of it was that i mean it, it, these are i think the stages through which arjuna went in the first chapter so first there's the outer conflict right in the outer world 
the two battling armies. Then this precipitated an inner conflict. And this inner conflict, because it was irresolvable how to deal with the outer conflict before him. So this was very painful. So this conflict turned into pain. And then he tried to work it out rationally how to deal with this. And he found it to be hopeless. And this is the suffering in which he found himself. Um, and so what happened, you know, by the end of the first chapter, he rendered useless. <laughs> he's, he, he has a meltdown, for heaven's sake. Mm, but, then, but then he turns to Krishna. Then he turns to Krishna. Please teach me. Please guide me. Mm. Boy, was Krishna an amazingly loving and understanding friend. He hardly spoke a word. A couple of words he spoke. That's it. While Arjuna is dumping the contents of his suffering, shattered heart to Krishna. Hmm. Krishna hardly said a thing. Isn't that a good friend who will listen? Hmm. Too. He didn't speak. Note that he did not speak until Arjuna was receptive. He did not impose anything on Arjuna until Arjuna was ready. He did not insist on anything at all until Arjuna showed um, a, a, uh, a desire to be guided from Krishna. Hmm, that's true. So in one sense, that's also a teaching lesson over here that, like what do you say, don't, uh, what is it, in counseling, they say don't, what is it, don't, don't advise till you're hired or something like that. Some, I don't know <laughs> yeah. what saying, but it's like, yeah. while Krishna wants to help, he, he helps when Arjuna actually seeks help. Otherwise, That's Krishna right. lets Arjuna wind himself out. So, That's Arjuna right. does his own reasoning and then he realizes, hey, this is getting me nowhere. That's right. In one sense, and Arjuna says, at the end of the first chapter, I will not fight. And in 2.10, he says, I will not fight. Those are two different. One is more of, I have given my decision. But the other is, unless you help me understand, Till that time, I'm not going to fight because in between he's surrendering. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's a yeah. external action is the same, but the internal conception has changed. And when that change is there. Right. So we could say also that, like what, what we say that uh, in the human condition and the dilemma and even the trauma of the human condition, the God is there, the divinity is there to help us. But uh, uh, we need to turn then divinity manifests and helps. As divinity yes. doesn't force, force, uh, on, force themselves on us. That's right. By the way, one related question, maybe if you want to go into this. See, you prefer the word divinity to God. I presume that God has certain connotations which may not apply to Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. That's why you use prefer the word divinity? The word you know the funny thing about the word God, even though to a Western audience, God means generally God the creator. But in the Gita, we don't think of Krishna as a mere creator, mm, but the sustainer know, of all reality. Yeah, earlier what is this? Creation is like subcontracted to someone. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, subcontracted out. Yes, subcontracted out to Brahma, you know. But, but you know, the word God, it's ironic because the word God in English comes from the old German, Gotha, Gotha. And Gotha, come, the old German, Gotha, comes from the Sanskrit, Huta, the one to whom I make an offering. Huta, the Vedic Sanskrit word, Huta. So from Huta we get Gotha. From Gotha we get God. But it doesn't carry over the early Vedic sense of the word. Okay. 
That's right. So the word divinity reflects the word in Sanskrit, devata. Devata, divinity. Hmm. Purusham, you know, paramam purusham divyam, the supreme personality of Godhead, right? Purusham, you know, uh, purusham, paramam purusham divyam. Um, you know, the idea here is that that God the word God can be used, but it has to be explained that it's not really exactly like the way we understand God. So sometimes in my published writing, I'll do interchanging of the word God and the divine or God and divinity. But I prefer the words, the more direct words that translate deva and, and, and devata, you know, the divine deva, divinity, devata. Okay. And if you use divinity, what pronoun would we use for that? Is it? I, I, it sounds a little too impersonal, isn't it? It does. Um, uh, I try to avoid uh, the sort of gendered pronouns, um, but uh, but uh, you know because gender here is different than gender there. Very true. Yeah. Also, it's so, not so much going down to the political correctness about not using male gender, but it's also right. superimposing. Uh, our conception of a limit, over there. right, right. Mm. But this is this is you know in writing and in speaking, one has to just work the words to make sure that they're doing what you need them to do according to your realization and and, and your and your teaching. So um, this is always a challenge for a speaker and a writer. I like the way we work the words. So in one to work the words. No word may fit the con the conception or the definition or the whole thought process that we want to convey. Then we may have to specify this is what we mean when we use this word, and then use it like that. That's right. That's right. That's true. Yes, true. And go ahead. So we're talking about divinity. Let's move forward. Yes. Yeah. So this is yes. Second principle was that divinity so turns to us, or divinity. Extra, when we turn to divinity, then divinity is there to help or to intervene. To yes. Hmm. Yes. But this is, of course, the second the second message of how do we live in a world of conflict, pain, and suffering. So this is, of course, when Arjuna turns to Krishna. Um, he Arjuna experienced this conflict in the outer world, how that conflict precipitated a certain level of pain. And then ultimately a state of suffering, a, a shattered heart. Um, so the third principle is that in the tacit teaching of the Gita is that, although it doesn't come out specifically say this, but it does say that, you know, in so many words, that this outer world will always be filled with conflicts that cannot be solved. Don't, don't expect a perfect peace in this world. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Okay? That's what the Gita says in so that's many words. A, yeah, that is something very striking that the Gita doesn't really give Arjuna any explanation about why he is fighting this war. Why he was put, like, yeah. it doesn't go into any sort of like, say, previous life crime story or previous life karma or whatever. It In one sense, it is... In, again, working the words, it's very, you could say, existentialist in its approach. Okay, this is the situation yep. you are in. Now, how to deal with it? <laughs> That's what right. The yeah. best way you can deal with it, or the best consciousness you can have, what is the best uh, understanding of reality you can have? So, yeah. Mm, and in one sense, that, That's is, right. that is actually a more, at least to the contemporary mind, it's a more appealing approach. Because in some ways, okay, why are you in this situation? Uh, tracing back to a previous life to explain the dilemma that one is facing, that can yes. satisfy some people who already believe in previous lives. But for others, it just seems to be, what do you say, push the kettle backwards or just, uh, it seems to be yeah. bringing, in, bringing in some uh, piling up presupposition on presupposition. You can't explain this, right. so you bring another supposition to it. So the Gita's approach can appeal more to a rational mind than 
talking about previous life's causes or anything like that. That's right. That's right. Mm. That's right. Of course, you know, as you and I know, the Gita does acknowledge that there are previous lives, sanskaras that carry over from a previous life into this life. Uh, these are ways to explain, you know, things that happen in this life that are otherwise inexplicable. Mm. Um you know, either very difficult things or very wonderful things. Um, you know, uh, Mozart composing, you know, symphonic orchestral pieces at age seven. <laughs> this, this does not, this is simply impossible for any seven-year-old. I mean, it's just impossible to write a whole score of orchestral work. I mean, it's just, who can do this? This is obviously a carryover from a previous life. Hmm. So, so what I was talking about, two things over here. The, the, again, the Gita focuses more on principles than on specifics. So yes, yes. The situations we are in now, positives, negatives, they could be explained in terms of previous lives. And, and in fact, we could say that that may well be the most reasonable explanation for those situations. But yes, uh, understanding those doesn't necessarily help us uh, to deal with the situations because after all we have to understand the specifics may not necessarily help us to deal with the situation as it is because even if some people right. need to understand the specific that's like, almost like esoteric knowledge and yes when what about if if the specific explanations of our past that have put us in the present situation become the basis for us to to be equipped for dealing with the situations then we could say that is available for a very small fragment of humanity. So yes. the Gita doesn't, in that sense, uh, it acknowledges the esoteric principles, but it does not base its guideline on those this kind of esoteric principles that are not accessible to everyone. Right. Mm. Beautiful. That's right. So, so the fourth. So, so I guess now, when you're saying ethical yeah. problems, it was resolvable. This is yes. almost at a somewhat deeper level than, say, the Dukkhale Ashashvata or the, even the Buddhist concept of Dukkha. It is almost like yeah. not just that the world is a place of distress, but how mm. you have to act in the world, even that can be a cause of difficulty and distress. Yes, indeed. Mm. So the first two points we could say are included in that, that the human condition is a condition of distress and that to, we need to turn toward the divine. But even if we turn toward the divine, still certain ethical problems may remain irresolvable. That's right. That's mm. right. It's the nature of this world. Mm. For there are always to be conflict. Yeah. So now when you say, I'm just, because we earlier discussed about the difference between the Gita and uh, other sacred texts. So that yes. irresolvability of ethical problems isn't this also a teaching of the Bible to some extent, the book of Job? Uh, ultimately, even when God speaks in a divine voice to Job, who's gone through all those travails, ultimately he says, did you know where you were when you were born and things like that? So there also, it seems that it's something similar, that ethical problems are irresolvable. Or there are yes. differences. Yeah. Yes. And it's, it's, it's certainly the teachings of the Bible and the New Testament and Quran are extraordinary. I mean, they're beautiful teachings in, in these three wonderful uh, sacred texts. But there, it, it, it stands in contrast to this kind of these, these 700 verses that are so pithy and loaded with transcendental meaning. Um, and of course, all scriptures are worth reading and rereading and rereading, you know, indefinitely. Mm. When one does this with the Gita, though, it turns into a meditation. It turns into a form of yoga, a dhyana. It's a it's swadhyaya yoga, you know. The repetition of these sacred verses over and over themselves become a meditation that is just profound. Okay. That's beautiful. Yes, true. So after all, you know, it is written in poetry. Um, it's in poetic verse. It's not just ordinary prose. 
So the Gita is itself working the words of philosophy, but also is framing it in a kind of poetic, very uplifting framework. Mm. That's nicely put up. Framing an uplifting framework. Yes. yes, the power of poetry is engaged. You know, many of the, uh, the, the bhakti theologians of the 16th century, they had extraordinary capacity to articulate the theological nuances of the Krishna bhakti tradition. No doubt. But even they, with their erudition, says, they say at one point, they get to a point and they say, I now have to write poetry or write a drama to express what I'm really talking about here. They resort to art after theology. They push theological art articulation as far as it can go, and then what do they do? They start writing poetry or writing a drama. Hmm. It's beautifully put. So, any reason why fourth, you know, in 16th century? Because in one sense, the Gita dates much further back. Uh. Um, yes, of course. To, to historians, there you know there are arguments back and forth which came yeah, earlier. Yeah, but I don't think anybody says 15th, 16th century. Are they just talking more about the Gaudiya tradition specifically in this context? Oh yes, the the yeah the Chaitanya Vaishnava tradition. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it does seem yeah. from a historical perspective also that uh, Sanskrit poetry had a what you would say a flowering in in that time. Yes. It ran Gaudiya tradition also and other traditions also. It seems that if you consider a little earlier, uh, there is, seems to be some like something like a, you could say almost a developmental arc in, arc in terms of sophistication of the. Uh, compositions. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. So in terms of poetry, even the Gita is, yeah, it's uh, the Bible and the Quran, we can't really call them poetry in that, in the conventional sense of the word. They're wisdom. Right. They're not poetry. Yes. That sounds like but, but their words are, their words are of course, very powerful. Um, yeah. And, um, uh, they have their own, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, embedded power there. Um, but again, each tradition, you know, is different. You know, each tradition is unique. Yes. You know, Hebrew, Hebrew is so different than the Greek. And Greek is so different from the Arabic. Hmm. And Arabic, of course, is so different from the Sanskrit. True. Yes. So the fourth idea that we talked about, right? The fourth idea, to be sensitive to the thoughts and feelings of other humans, of other living beings, and in general, to be sensitive to all life, and thus to hold all life as precious. Okay. All life as precious. Yes. To respect all living beings, to be sensitive to the life force of all living beings. This is certainly one of the teachings of the Gita. Hmm. That's uh, in one sense, while the Gita is calling for war where there is where it's going to involve killing of human beings, at the same time, uh, while circumstantially killing may be required. Essentially, it affirms the sanctity of life and all life by yes. uh, pointing out how the how the source of life, the source of consciousness, that soul, is is in one sense not the monopoly of human beings. Right. Yeah. I think this is a subject which uh, which comes up quite often. We talk about in the how the Gita is also very conducive for environmental consciousness because it from the sanctity of all life. Now, maybe we could, unless you want to elaborate on this further, we could go ahead because it's an important principle, but 
it's a it's it's a, you could say a well known distinctive principle of the gita yes mm. yes in fact yeah i mean we learn in reading the gita that krishna is you know from krishna all these beautiful manifestations within the world come uh, the sparks of his splendor right as in chapter 30 the end verses chapter 30 and but we also learn that krishna is in the heart of all living beings so how can we disrespect or harm other living beings when we know krishna's presence krishna's presence in many ways is saturating this world on the other hand there's much darkness which separates itself from krishna's divine presence even within this world hmm true beautiful the famous i am statements the famous i am declarations in the 7th chapter the 9th chapter the 10th chapter okay. these these you know affirmations you know of luminaries i am the moon and the sun beautiful i mean there are ways to worship krishna right here in nature right here in the in the celestial bodies um just in the way that reality is constructed beautiful beautiful um statements by krishna in the gita hmm all life is precious because all life comes from him all life comes from the divine so uh, yeah that's true so it now this i am statements in one sense is it like the gita style the i am is a very emphatic form of self identification without any qualification and somebody reads only yes. those then it might almost seem that the gita is endorsing a pantheistic conception of divinity so we could say that the gita accepts pantheism but it accepts that divinity is something much more than that and if somebody can accept right. the pantheism then okay there's something for you also in the gita is that how we see right. the i am statements yeah that's right that's right hmm. it's really not so much pantheistic as it is panentheism you know yeah uh, which includes both levels yeah yeah that would require us to look at the look beyond those statements itself because those statements don't leave any room for qualification like a very direct declaration. right and if you look at the that's right philosophy of the gita then definitely it is panentheistic not pantheistic that's right yeah that's right so when you say the i am statements is it like a is it something which you because you mentioned there were the famous i am statements so is it something which is widely acknowledged as a feature of the gita i am this i am that or uh, <clears throat> i i never thought of the translations i am statements like in the yes. bible what is that in something like when jesus is asked the question i am who i am or something like that he says god is that statement is yeah. used to convey that he the god is beyond definition or is some or not is it jesus yeah. is it yahweh i am yeah that's right the four letters of yahweh mean i am that i am that's right okay so when you use the word i am were you correlating those with that or it is just a restatement of the gita how it states well just because um krishna says over and over i am he uses the the, the first person singular aham right mm. um so um you know i i want to reflect as much as possible what is there in in characterizing the gita okay. so uh i would say that the i am statements are unique to the gita although you know god in 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 the quran and in the bible a new testament i mean uh, he will declare uh, himself in relation to the celestial bodies and so on but not quite like um krishna does with this world i believe there's a much more intimate connection between krishna and this world expressed in the gita yeah intimate connection okay yeah that's so true in fact we could say that uh as we progress in our understanding of krishna 
it is not just we appreciate krishna transcendently existing in his abode or as a relationship with the devotees but we also we also perceive krishna within this world more and more and yes it's fascinating actually if you look at it at the end of chatur shloki gita krishna is talking about the four verses that how in one sense devotees live transcendent to the world they see krishna as a soul they discuss about him they delight in him but then it concludes that krishna guides from within in the world and then arjuna's yes, question yes. after that is okay how do i see you in this world so yes so it's 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 that the gita has transcendental wisdom but it in one sense it never loses sight of this worldly concerns or functioning in this world yes yes indeed yes so this was the oh, this was the fourth principle now we're discussing that was the fourth one yes to hold all life precious right yes and the fifth one is ultimately reality embraces us everywhere from the space within purusha from the space without as the vishwarupa so in a way that we've already been talking about that a little bit in the fourth one right the vishwarupa and further as brahman yet from within the deepest space of the heart the divine calls us to come to him or lovingly submit ourselves to him that's amazing by the way uh, in in the other religious traditions is there anything like the universal form that is mentioned to your knowledge mm. um the universal form i mean in in a kind of overall effect of power overwhelming divine power there is something of that rasa and that is why um rc zainer in his translation of the bhagavad gita in the 1950s i believe um says in the beginning of the chapter uh chapter 11 he tells the reader that this is the climactic moment of the gita when krishna displays his universal form and i have fought vehemently against that statement i don't agree with that god's power is not as powerful as god's intimate connections with humans that's even more powerful hmm and in one sense that's why at the end arjuna in one sense says i want to see your intimate form and krishna also that's right. universal form is rare but this two handed form is the most rare so rare that even the celestials even the gods want to see this form that's right hmm. so the, actually that chapter is anticlimactic while rc zainer professor zainer is claiming it to be climactic it is not and since when do you put the climactic scene of a drama in the middle of the drama and not at the end no one does that it's always at the end of a drama mm. and in fact the 18th chapter is extremely dramatic and extremely intense Yeah, um, that is true. And it's summarizing. Yeah. And, Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, so broadly speaking, the eleventh chapter is definitely not climactic, and it is also not. Uh, we could say the, the the idea of pantheism or some level of God's presence everywhere that might be there in various that is there in various traditions. Omnipresence is also one of the attributes of divinity, but the specific meaning right. of god pervading or god giving a visible manifestation where he pervades all of existence i i haven't read anything like that in any of the sacred literatures of any other sacred literatures of the world have you some vision like this not really hmm. not really um it's it's uh, definitely it's uh, that, but we have to acknowledge that each tradition reveals a unique vision of ultimate reality and and that's and that's fine yes of course but it's 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 about again it's about the the relationship humans and humanity can have with divinity um and this is where i think the bhagavad gita stands out that there is this kind of direct 
interaction between humanity and divinity. Hmm. That's wonderful, Ro. Now, reality embraces us. So the, in the Christian tradition, they have the concept of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes yes. I have heard some devotees equated with the Paramatma, that God is present everywhere. But I found it a little uh, questionable because in their ideas, the Holy Spirit is something descends when you accept Jesus as a savior and then the Holy Spirit animates you and speaks through you. So as you said, right. sometimes because each tradition is offering a distinctive conception of divinity, it may not be even possible or even necessary to compare conceptions like that. Yes. Mm. That's right. That's right. You know, each, each religion has its own rasa, you know, its own relationship. Um, just like uh, we as children each have a different kind of relationship with the parents. We're not exactly the same as siblings, you know, uh, therefore the parents relate to us differently. Um, so religious traditions, they, they will bring out aspects of divinity that will be very different than our own, um, even though we may have been more theologically progressive and active than these others. Um, still, mm. they project they project a certain quality and ambiance of relating with divinity that we need to learn to respect. Okay. Yeah. So we could say that rather than uh, talking about, so when we're having, say, a presentation of the Gita in a broader uh, setting, rather than talking about the superiority of the Gita's presentation, we could talk about the distinctiveness of the presentation or the uniqueness of the presentation. What yes. our tradition brings, uh, brings specially to the, we could say the religious table of interfaith or whatever we want to discuss. Hmm. That's right. I like the example of children also, each, each child having a different relationship yeah. to the parent. Yeah. And not only that, but there are different families of traditions. So there are families in the West, Western, the Semitic traditions, the Abrahamic traditions, the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. That's one family. And, and, and those are the siblings. South Asian traditions, that's another family. Um, uh, you know, Vedic Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. And while they all draw from the same colors and the same uh, with the same uh, paintbrush, by the time it gets down on canvas, each one is unique. Mm, each one. And then there's the family of Eastern traditions, Far Eastern traditions, Confucius, Taoist, and um, Shinto traditions. There. So these are the three major families of, of religion. Yeah. Can you repeat the three ones? Which are the ones? So there, there's the Western family okay. um, of Semitic traditions. Okay. Um, there's the there's the Far Eastern ones of Confucianism, Taoism, and, and Shinto. But then there's the South Asian sort of central um, family uh, that goes in between them. And there you have Vedic Hinduism. You've got uh, Buddhism, Jainism, and much later, you've got Sikhism. Sikhism, okay. That's interesting. Is Confucianism actually considered a religious tradition? Or that itself becomes yeah. a question? Of what is a religion? Well, it, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, both. Um, it is considered. I mean, I teach when I teach religions of the East, I teach Confucianism, for sure. Okay. They believe that the way of heaven the way of heaven, Li, enters into relationships of this world. Okay, so we are defining religion broadly as any, any system of thought which talks about aspiring for something beyond this world. Even if a, That's right. there's no emphasis on a conception of divinity. Or actually, by that way, even Buddhism can be called not a religion, but it is definitely a religion in one sense. That's right. That's right. 
Okay. Yeah, I had heard about these two traditions. Uh, there are different ways of classifying. Also, this one is the the sometimes the Western traditions are considered to be more history centered traditions because they they give a primary importance to some historical events that define and lay the foundation for their traditions and they yes. see as far as more of dharmic traditions are more of they're not in history centered as principle centered and of course there are historical events right. avatars come but in one sense those avatars don't define the tradition it is more like the teachings of the principles that define the tradition yes in one sense you couldn't really define christianity without jesus and That's right. you couldn't really define islam without muhammad and of course allah would yeah. specifically so yeah so that was one classification i had heard i suppose then when you talk about the eastern traditions even they would be focusing more on principles is it yes confucianism yeah you could say it might not have been there without confucius being there but then he's not the center of the teachings right that's right yeah that's right yes true yeah there are some speakers that that uh, deliver m- messages of the tradition and other speakers who are themselves the focus or the center of the tradition about which they are speaking um mm-hmm. so um they're teaching it and revealing it at the same time and such is the case with the gita yeah that's true so but at the same time then we understand that krishna is when krishna is revealing himself it's not so much about history it's about transcendence and he's talking yeah. about so the from the gita's perspective specifically the specific time when krishna appeared and the specific activities that krishna did in vrindavan from the gita's perspective i'm saying we can't really divorce everything but from the gita's perspective they are themselves not that important the, the yeah. principle, somebody can appreciate krishna and the gita even without necessarily going into the, spe- the specifics of the bhakti tradition that are described elsewhere the conception that's of right that is complete in itself in the gita that's right mm. yeah beautifully put so you're saying that uh, so we discussed the principle of how reality is enveloping us and that connection yes that uh, uh, embracing us and then we discuss a little bit about the how there are different conceptions of what embracing us means and that's then, right that's the fifth one you that's right to, yeah Yes. So the sixth one, right? So that was the fifth one, right? That uh, we are being embraced. So the sixth one naturally follows, which is the divine is calling us, and it is a matter. It is a matter whether we can hear it or not. Um, Krishna speaks about souls offering themselves to him, or even coming to him throughout the conversation, at least twenty-two times. So this is a powerful. sub theme but it seems like a major theme at the same time krishna is talking about souls coming to his heart souls coming to his state of being by this 22 times you are are you talking more about mam upetya krishna say come to me that the other kind of verses you are talking about yeah that's right that's right mm. he's preoccupied about those who come to him why because he wants he desires that yeah that's right so if we consider the gita it is uh, it seems that overall while krishna is instructing uh, arjuna how to live in this world krishna is also and yes. thinking that his uh, his ultimate goal is not in this world so you could say it's both <laughs> this right. worldly and other worldly it's not in the That's same right. other worldly it is not neglecting the this worldly but in the That's right. this worldly it's also not neglecting the other worldly so when yeah yeah that's nice so krishna is calling us so we could say the pre- earlier parts were about this worldly how to deal with and life is precious and uh, we how do we deal with the human condition and those parts we could say a little bit more this worldly hmm? right so krishna has that purpose when he says dharma samsthapanarthaya but then he also talks yes. about 
mad bhavam agata in this way you become devoted just two verses later 4.748 is right. dharma 49 is about coming to me so in one sense are we also in these eight principles we could say we are moving from this world to the other world now isn't it yeah that's Basically, almost the yeah. first four principles are about this world yes the first principles are from this world and then moving toward the other world but then finally going back into this world in the end as ambassadors of divine of the divine heart okay as ambassadors of the divine heart okay yes indeed That's so that would be the last principle right we'll come to so in one sense we look at this world differently then we look at the lord differently and then once we look at the divinity then we become as i said ambassadors or channels channels for for maybe bringing a positive divine change in this world indeed mm. yes yes bro that's beautiful maybe we can go ahead and discuss then yes mm. so the seventh one is um the most intimate connection as you said earlier yes it's moving to that other world but then in number 8 we'll come back to this world the most intimate connection with the divine is available to humans but it is the greatest secret among all secrets and it is the gita's supreme teaching of yoga so we have talked about this in other podcasts the supreme secret of yoga sarva guyatam ampuya shrunu me paramang bacha ishtosi medritamiti tatovakshami te etam 1864 you are so much loved by me this is the greatest secret of all secrets sarva guyatam so this is the highest right once we have really embraced that then number 8 comes along and we become ambassadors of that supreme secret in fact krishna says one who explains the supreme secret to others is the dearest devotee to me is most loved by me he says that you know this these verses mm. that's in fact is the most loved in the gita yeah hmm so true yes sir so these are these um a principle so let let's uh, also in the interest of time let's move to the number 8 where i say yes once this deeper deepest inner connection is made sorry i just we then become calling us yeah? the divinity is calling us on the 6th and the 7th was the okay so divinity in the 6th is calling us the 7th we are finally embraced of uh, this this divine yearning we've understood this divine yearning this divine calling we hear that um uh that uh, we've realized that the greatest secret of all is that a divinity loves us and yearns for us so much and we're connecting with that so once we've realized that then we this deepest inner t- connection is has been made we then become capable of acting out of love and thus cultivating a genuine sensitivity toward all beings and toward the earth so we become ambassadors we return in effect to deliver this message of of ishtosi medritamiti this supreme secret of yoga this um uh, uh, greatest secret of all you know guyam param yogam the greatest secret of yoga uh, gu, uh, uh, you know sarva guyatam ambuya the greatest secret of all the ekagra the single highest point these when we've grasped these we return to this world and we become ambassadors of the divine heart mm that's beautiful i remember you had mentioned some point about human human being human form being an opportunity is this within the seventh itself or that's the next one because not something like a human in humanity in humanity has an opportunity to reciprocate with divinity was that one point which oh had- Oh, well it, it, it now that point um is really i think implicit in seven that that the the most intimate connection with the divine is available to humans okay so yeah in one sense this also you could say that while we acknowledge that 
all life is precious this is also giving a special place for humans so yes in one sometimes exactly. i think the christian theology is applied or we could say misapplied depending on how you want to look at it to to claim human exceptionalism so the gita does not really accept human exceptionalism and that humans are special but we could say that not that humans are special in category but rather yeah. humans are more special in degree that the same spirit yeah. is manifesting in all living beings but it's the consciousness of special manifested to a special degree in humans right beautiful yes yeah by the way just a quick thought that in general within the gita krishna does not talk about the speciality of the human form it's almost assumed because he is speaking to a human being he, and it is a yeah that's right and that is a discussion isn't it that's right that is interesting yeah yeah okay but but yes and but you know be arjuna really is standing in for the rest of us and so um you know we 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 don't have bhagavad gita with chipmunks i mean we you know i mean it's it's uh, there are no chipmunks uh, that are in in stress uh, the way arjuna found himself to be in stress so <laughs> so, so yeah it, it is it is very much a uh, a human privilege to be in connection with all ultimate reality i mean this is this is a human privilege we are not instinct driven animals we are animals that have been um uh given an opportunity to transcend animal life okay that makes sense beautiful so what would be the contra word we could use for if not instinct what would be the word we could use for describing yes we are very conditionable beings so we don't act out of instinct we act out of conditioning then the question becomes what conditioning are we conditioned by the divine or are we conditioned by the forces of the world hmm. we are condition driven not instinct driven animals are inst- primarily instinct driven yes they also can find some conditionings and so on in the one life but but humans the 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 power of culture the power of of education and knowledge is extraordinary um and those things can either be used to elevate the self to transcendence and to divinity or for further you know um shackling uh, within this limited world that's why when when we are connecting with the divine yearning of divinity when that really you know just saturates our being we can then return to this world with being conditioned by that yearning that is the ideal condition of the human mm, beautifully put yeah but i i have to go soon so maybe we should uh, wind things up with your beautiful summary yeah please <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. so that, so we did we discuss the eighth principle the seventh was that we have the intimate relationship we have the potential for the intimate yes. in eight was is is that we come we 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 are able to bring this we become this, ambassadors um, we can act out of love we can truly act out of love in this world and we can become ambassadors and we can be genuinely sensitive to all living beings and even the earth yeah it's beautiful in one sense krishna says that he first says surudam sarvabhutana and the welfare of all living beings that's 529 but in 1213 yes. when he's talking about his devotees he is saying advaishta sarvabhutana maitra karuna evacha so in one sense the same yeah. quality of divinity is manifesting in those who are connected with divinity so yes could you say that prabhupad manifested this when he was there with us he was man absolutely love of uh, absolutely love of Prabhu, love of krishna to the world yes mm. he brought this message to us he showed us that this is what krishna desires 
most ardently. This is what Krishna. This is what Krishna desires us to become. What Krishna wants yes. to become. Yeah, that's right. Beautifully put. Yes, true. So, so we could say this is the culmination of human potential. What human beings can, what we can be, and what we can do in the world. It's not just about turning towards God, but it's also about becoming who we are meant to be at its fullest level. when we become a master yes. for god so it's not just like self realization in the other worldly sense but we could say it's almost like self actualization or self fully actualizing our potential in this world also yes mm. yes for that's beautiful so i'll try to quickly summarize then it's been yes amazing Gee. so we broadly discussed about the universal principles eight universal principles of the gita and we started by talking about how the gita is uh, it starts with it it is somewhat different from other sacred texts whereas we yeah. sound like scripture because they start with uh, divinity speaking whereas here it is with the human condition starting so in that sense it's not say it might not seem like a scripture but it is like a scripture which very much addresses the human condition that is the first point and then in that connection and we also discussed a little bit about when you are articulating these eight principles we are taking universe yes. this, we are uh, retaining the specific uh, insights of our tradition but we are also presenting them in universal terms and that's what we mm-hmm. have to, get to work with words so we later we yes. talk about how the word god has more of a connotation of a creator and divinity is a you could say a little a more representative of what krishna what krishna is in the gita so mm-hmm. that is the the first principle we discussed is how it's it speaks to the human condition and the way to live in this human condition is to turn toward the divine so krishna is, is so on the battlefield it is kurukshetra can seem very specific and sectary specific but dharmakshetra the field of action or the 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 how we can sanctify our sphere of action that yes. universal concern and the gita's question is about that dharma and that is the answer that is going to be provided so krishna guides arjuna when he turns towards him and in one sense so that is the second point about how to deal with the human condition is by how to live in the human condition by turning to the divine but even when he turn to the divine it's not that we are going to become omniscient certain ethical mm-hmm. problems may still remain irresolvable and yes thing that is just a part of again the human condition and functioning on but that doesn't mean we mm-hmm. don't get wisdom to move forward but the right. the gita focus doesn't focus on we could say it accepts the principle of previous lives it's a very important part of its teachings but its focus is not on what happened to whom in the previous lives but okay we all have been shaped by our past but how can we best function now to face life that its focus yeah. and that involves we could say recognizing that some problems will be unsolvable and then while we are functioning in the world mm-hmm. then we look at almost the whole world as sacred as all life as precious so the idea that yeah. god is present his presence pervades existence so that is also related to the so one is we could say the sanctity of life now sanctity we could have sanctity of life at various levels of understanding but the next is that yeah. the ultimate reality is itself present and embraces us from everywhere so there we yes. talk about the universal form being quite a distinctive revelation different religions are more like they have their own rasa so we don't want to compare to minimize any tradition but we, we if you are comparing it's more to present the distinctiveness of the uniqueness of each tradition so yes the idea of universal form pervading all of existence and that is quite distinctive and at the same time that which is this very distinctive Mm, contribution of our tradition is actually not its conclusive it's in one sense mm. it is it gives way to the more intimate personable uh, vision of divinity as krishna so then reality is yeah. not just embracing us uh, but it's also calling us so yes. we, it, that we not just that it's a, it's not a passive passive presence it's more like mm. an active mm. call active person calling out with love Mm, nice. Nice. Comes. And then we discuss in that connection how 
that so the gita in one sense moves from this world and how to function in this world to how to raise our eyes to the other world and then connect mm. with the divine and then yes so divinity is calling and the gita gives us various processes how we can reciprocate with the divine and then the most yes. spiritual secret the gita's various pathways culminate in bhakti yoga towards the end mm. the path of love you could say where we can have the, we have, we humans have the potential for the most intimate relationship the most intimate union with the divine and yes. then it's not just that we reject the world after that but that we turn to this world and then we become ambassadors of divine the divine we mm. act in a way that we could say we do the we do the divine will we help we bring that higher consciousness in the world to to we could say to develop our full potential and make the best contributions that we could in this world so this yes is, so uh it's every time i discuss the bhagavad gita it's almost as if hey how did i not see this in the gita before <laughs> <laughs> that's the value of katha dialogue yeah samvadam samvadam yeah beautiful yeah thank you very much bro wonderful discussion i look forward thank to you so much chaitanya charanji <laughs> yes yes all glories to gita jayanti yes indeed thank you Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.